Thank you. Uh, uh, can everyone hear me clearly? Okay. So um, today I'm going to talk about limits of noisy metrology with uh, restricted quantum control. Uh, okay. So as a basic introduction to quantum metrology, quantum metrology is the science of estimation in quantum systems. And uh, here are just a few examples. The first one is optical interferometry. You have an unknown parameter in your quantum system, which is the difference between two optical paths. And uh, then you try to use interferometry to estimate the phase difference between two optical paths. And then this is a question uh, in quantum metrology. And then the second example is um, atomic clock, where you uh, the unknown parameter is the 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 laser frequency, and then you try to use a bunch of qubits uh, or atoms to sense how large is the laser frequency here, which is um, an application in atomic clock. And, and then this is also uh, falls in the range of quantum metrology. And finally, you can use, for example, like nitrogen vacancy centers as uh, qubits to detect uh, like magnetic fields or electronic fields, which can be uh, unknown in the quantum system. And then this also um, is an example of quantum metrology. So um, I'm not going to talk about any specific experimental platform. Instead, I'm going to focus on a um, abstract model behind uh, this uh, experiment, which is the following. So basically in all quantum metrology, or most quantum metrology experiments, you all always have some kind of quantum signal you want to detect in your quantum system. And then you also have some level of quantum noise in the system. So this is something that inherently uh, exists in your quantum system, and then you cannot have control over that. Uh, instead, what you can control is how to uh, generate uh, an input state, which is a state preparation part, and then how what kind of measurement you perform in your quantum system. And then finally, what kind of quantum control you apply during the evolution of the system. So basically you try to control these three parts in order to maximize the sensitivity with respect to your quantum signal. So, um, so for a um, more information theoretical uh, language, uh, you can call this a quantum channel estimation. So basically I would assume you have a quantum channel uh, which is an arbitrary CPTP map that depends on some unknown parameter omega. And then I also, for simplicity, I assume omega is like around uh, zero. So it's, it's basically a real number and I assume like it, the, the true value is around zero. And then uh, here is uh, something called sequential strategy, which is basically one type of quantum control uh, you can apply to uh, sense this unknown parameter. In this case, you are allowed to have an arbitrary input state and then an arbitrary quantum control you can apply it during the evolution and finally a quantum measurement. So this is called sequential strategy because here the uh, quantum channel applies on a single probe multiple times instead of uh, this strategy where you, okay, where you basically ap apply the um, quantum channel on multiple probes, multiple uh, in parallel multiple times. So this is not as general as a sequential strategy, but it is also widely applied in quantum metrology. And uh, one question to answer is with uh, these strategies and with the number of channels sufficiently large, what's the scaling of the estimation error uh, with respect to the number of channels? So there are two types of limits people usually consider. Uh, the first one is Heisenberg limit. So it describes the situation where the estimation error is proportional to one over n. And then the second limit is standard quantum limit. Uh, it describes the situation where the estimation error is one over square root of n. So there are actually the only two type of limits that is allowed. If you optimize over uh, all the sequential strategy or parallel strategy. So basically you choose the optimal sequential strategy for the specific quantum channel and then you get either one of this uh, scaling. And uh, basically you can achieve the standard quantum limit by just using product state. And uh, you don't need any entanglement in order to achieve the standard quantum limit. But in order to achieve the Heisenberg limit, you, you need to use some kind of entangled uh, state or maybe a coherent evolution of the quantum system. 
So, and then there's another equivalent way to say these two type of limit, which is using the language of um, uh, quantum feature information. So basically, uh, the estimation error can be related to the concept called quantum feature information through this primal bound. So it basically states that the estimation error can be as small as one over the square root of QFT if you choose the uh, suitable estimator uh, to detect uh, omega. So if the feature information is n square, you achieve the Heisenberg limit, and then the, if the feature information is linear, you achieve the standard quantum limit. So here's a bit more detail on how exactly do you distinguish between these two cases. And uh, then it basically depends on one specific criterion that, that you can easily verify for a specific quantum channel. It's called Hamiltonian not in crossband condition. So basically given a quantum channel, you can calculate uh, the Hamiltonian of this quantum channel, which is defined using this formula over here. So you don't need to understand like why it has this expression, but basically you can calculate it and it is a Hermitian operator. And then the other thing is called the cross span or the span of noise. So it, it's basically a span of linear operators and uh, then you can, it is spanned by uh, the operator Ki dagger Kj. So if the Hamiltonian is not inside the cross span, you can build up some uh, quantum equation protocol that allows you to achieve the Heisenberg limit using the sequential or the parallel strategy. But on the other hand, uh, if uh, the Hamiltonian is inside the cross band, you, you cannot achieve that. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the details about that criterion, but I'm going to stick with this simple example throughout this talk. So in this example, I just have one qubit, and uh, then the Hamiltonian, uh, I would assume, is the poly Z operator, which is basically the uh, then you can consider the channel as a rotation uh, of the poly Z operator and then the strength of that rotation or the angle of that rotation is the omega, which is the, is the unknown parameter you want to estimate. And then if the error is a poly Z operator, you can see, uh, you can see that uh, the condition is actually not satisfied. So basically the Hamiltonian is inside the cross band. So the Heisenberg limit is not achievable. But on the other hand, if the error is uh, bit flip noise, that means the Hamiltonian is not inside the cross band and actually you can use the air correction to recover this Heisenberg limit. So uh, now I'm going to go to a bit detail in terms of how to achieve the Heisenberg limit or standard quantum limit with, uh, in this example. So in the first situation, I'm going to consider you have no noise at all. In that case, you don't need any type of quantum control, you just apply the same channel on the qubit multiple times. and uh, in a situation where you start with a plus state, you will have a phase difference, which is uh, omega n, and it is proportional to n uh, between zero and one. In that case, you naturally achieve the Heisenberg limit by performing a measurement on the, on the output quantum state. And uh, you can also achieve that using parallel strategy, which in, in which case you need to use a GHZ state as an input. So it generates, again, a phase difference that is proportional to n, which allows you to achieve the Heisenberg limit. So these are the two situations where you have no noise at all. And what happens if there's bit flip noise? So recall that if we have bit flip noise and poly Z Hamiltonian, we can actually recover the Heisenberg limit. So how do we do that? Uh, in fact, people would just use something called uh, a two qubit repetition code. Uh, why is it two qubit? Because we assume we have one noiseless ancilla, which is uh, this one over here. So this qubit is definitely correct. So basically we just need to correct the first qubit based on the information from the second qubit. We just align uh, the sign of these two qubits and then it actually corrects any bit flip noise. And in addition, it does not uh, destroy the poly Z Hamiltonian, although we might have a constant factor, uh, constant factor uh, difference between the optimal, like in the noiseless cases. But actually we can, asymptotically, we can always recover the Heisenberg limit uh, using the error correction in this way. And uh, similarly, if we consider the parallel strategy, again, we can use the GHZ state. Uh, the reason is that it, it is basically a super, like a logical plus state uh, with the repetition code. So again, you just use like majority voting to decode uh, the state and then it would give you back the Hamiltonian scaling. 
uh, as if there's no noise. Okay, so these are all like um, the situation where you can recover the Heisenberg limit. However, as I said, if you uh, if a noise is uh, the same as the Hamiltonian, which means your noise is is defacing, and the Hamiltonian is also z, in that case you can only achieve the standard quantum limit. And in order to do so, you just need to use, for example, like uh, a product state. Sorry, uh, there's no L uh, there. Okay, so this is the example. Um, from the previous literature. And uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that although we can recover the Heisenberg limit when there's noise, uh, the protocol is quite complicated. So for example, if we want to use the sequential strategy, uh, then we need to have a noiseless ancilla, which is quite expensive in practice. And we also need to perform CPTP channels during the evolution or at least some kind of mid circuit measurement, which uh, can be quite noisy in practice. And then uh, if we want to resort to the parallel strategy, that means we need to scale up the system to a very large system size. And moreover, we need to have like long range entanglement in both the sleep preparation part and the measurement part, which can also be quite uh, expensive in experiments. So this motivated us to study the case where we only have restricted type of quantum control. So, um, the first type of control I consider, which is the most restrictive case in this talk, is the ancilla free sequential strategy with only unital control. So basically, I assume no noiseless ancilla, and I also assume you can only perform unitary control during the evolution. And then there's another slightly more general protocol where I allow CPTB controls during the evolution, but then I allow no noiseless ancilla, as in the sequential strategy. And finally, there's a different, slightly more general protocol compared to the first one, uh, which is the situation where you can have a constant size of uh, ancilla, but then only unital uh, control during the evolution. So these are the three type of restricted control uh, strategy I consider. And uh, okay, so why is that important? So one important thing is that if you only consider qubit channel or qubit quantum noise, then with these three different type of strategy, you can no longer do any protocol with quantum error correction uh, with this restricted control. So, and uh, this is the first thing. And then the second thing, even the achievement of uh, standard quantum limit become, becomes non-trivial in this case. The reason is that uh, you can no longer do measurement every step of the evolution because every step you just do a unital control or CBDP controls, you only do one final measurement in the end. So this makes the situation much more complicated than the previous case. Okay, so now I'm going to discuss uh, what's the metrological limits under this restricted control. And I'm going to focus on uh, qubit channels. So the advantage of qubit channel is that uh, you can easily classify them. So there are actually three class of qubit channels. If you uh, ignore all the parameter dependence thing. So the first type of qubit channel is just unitary channel. You just have a one unitary rotation on your qubits. And then the second type, which I call the phasing class channel, uh, means that you can rotate the channel to a dephasing noise. So basically you can apply a unitary U before uh, the dephasing class channel, before the dephasing channel, and then a unitary V after the dephasing channel, and then uh, I, I call this type of channel the phasing class channel. For example, like bit flip noise is also a dephasing class channel because, because you can always rotate x to z. And uh, then finally, there's uh, if the channel does not belong to the first two type of uh, class, uh, it has to be a strictly contractive channel, meaning that it will uh, strictly contract uh, the, the trace distance between two quantum um, states. Okay, so uh, here's the, I'm going to show the result in this table. So basically on the horizontal line, I have different uh, strategy. The first one is the sequential parallel strategy and then the, the other three are the restricted type of strategy I consider. And on the, um, on the first column, I have four type of uh, qubit channel. So again, we have the unitary channel and the strictly strictly contractive channel. But then for the defacing class channel, I have to divide it into, into two types because actually uh, we have two situations. The first one is, again, uh, 
if the noise does not align with the signal, we would have uh, the channel falls into the first class. And then if the noise align with the uh, signal, it falls into the second class. OK, so then here's the result. Um, on the first column here, uh, we already know that we can use HNKS condition to help us determine the scaling of the quantum fish information. So basically, uh, if the if the channel is diffusing class channel or of the second type or the strictly contractive channel, we can show that the HNKS condition always fails. So that means the fish information is like uh, at most linear in this case. Okay. And then how about the other restricted control strategy? Um, know that here we show that basically for any noisy quantum channel that is not a unitary channel, the fission information is, is at most like linear or at least uh, it's not going to be quadratic. It's at most like n to the power of three over two. So how do we prove that? It's based on some analysis of the quantum fission information. And uh, we use something called the channel extension method that I'm not going to go to the detail here, but basically it, it depends on analysis of quantum fission information. So this, uh, and also we can prove that for the uh, defacing class channel of the first type. Okay, so basically for the defacing class channel of first, first type, which is the second line here, uh, we also find a linear lower bound on the fission information where we design some unitary control sequence that allows us to achieve the standard quantum limit without doing repeated quantum measurements throughout the evolution. So we just need to perform a unitary every time step and then one measurement in the end. Okay, and uh, then the other thing about uh, the fission information is that the fission information is at most a constant for defacing class channel of the second type uh, with the first type of restricted uh, strategy. And in order to prove that, we use some uh, calculation with the block sphere representation. And finally, in order to prove the constant fission information upper bound for strictly contractive channel, we just need to uh, use uh, the relation between uh, fission information and breast distance. And then we use some contraction coefficient with respect to the quantum fission information. So basically to summarize, uh, if we are allowed to perform sequential strategy or parallel strategy, there is a clear dichotomous behavior uh, between uh, between the channel that satisfies the HNKS condition and does not satisfy the HNKS condition. And uh, this is our uh, new probal separation. The first one is the separation between unitary channel and all the noisy quantum channel, where we show that for all noisy quantum channel, we cannot achieve uh, the Heisenberg limit anymore. Uh, and uh, then the other separation is the separation between the phasing class channel of the first type and uh, the other noisy quantum channel. So basically, uh, if it's a phasing class channel of the first type, we can achieve the standard quantum limit, but then for the other part, we cannot. It's just the constant quantum fusion information. So, uh, but uh, still there are many open questions. For example, we don't know the distinction between CPTB controls and unital controls. And then we don't know the distinction between the defacing class channel of the second type and uh, the strictly contracted channel. So finally, I'm just talk, going to talk a little bit about um, how the unitary control sequence actually works. So basically, if we have this noise and the Pauli Z Hamiltonian, we can actually achieve the standard quantum limit by only performing unitary control. And this, this is how it looks like. So it, it's, it's actually a control that is uniform throughout the evolution. It's going to be a rotation around the axis. And uh, then the angle depends on uh, n, which is the time steps. And uh, then in the end, you can have a, uh, a derivative of the uh, state that is uh, proportional to the square root of n. And uh, it implies that you can achieve the standard quantity. So here's the like a numerical simulation. You can see that uh, if you are allowed to use quantum error correction, you can definitely recover the Heisenberg limit. But if you only use unitary control, you can actually recover a very good linear uh, scaling of the quantum fusion equation. And then th this is even like more um, performs better in terms of the exact value of the quantum fusion information because uh, the fusion the fusion information is actually larger than the situation where you perform no control 
uh, but only repeated measurement. So, okay, so to summarize, um, I demonstrated that the structure of noise and the signal determines the estimation precision limits in metrology. And also I show that the Heisenberg limit is no longer achievable on the qubit noise, uh, but uh, the achievability of the standard quantum limit has a new dichotomous behavior. And some future direction include generalization to QD system, uh, and also to include measurement and feed forward controls uh, during the evolution. And finally, uh, how to calculate the exact value of the QFI instead of just the scaling of it um, is an open problem. So yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, hi, thank you for a very, very nice talk. And the, your main result, that table looks very nice. Just uh, one thing I'm quite curious about is what is the mathematic technique you use to get uh, that table and solve this question? Uh, if, if complicated, maybe just some ideas uh, if you could give. Yeah, so basically I need like uh, three type of techniques uh, as shown here. And uh, I think maybe the most important one is the is the first line, the channel extension method. Basically, uh, it gives gives you a simple way to calculate the quantum fission information of a quantum channel because, in general, it's pretty complicated. But uh, if you uh, fictitiously allow an ancillary system uh, as an input uh, of a quantum channel, then it gives you give you a expression of quantum fission information which is easier to compute. And you can express that using a semi-definite program. And uh, then basically by using this uh, channel extension method, you can bound uh, the quantum fish information, put bounds on quantum fish information. And then, for example, you can show that it's, it's at most linear if you use like linear quantum and so on. So that's some idea. And that, maybe the last line here, you, you need to calculate uh, the difference between the fish information of an input state and an output state. And then you can call that a contraction coefficient. And then that might also be useful, like improving, like the last line here. Yeah, I see. So it means with these techniques, you can have those conditions about which is the uh, give the condition to the to the control in this uh, process. Yeah. So basically, like uh, these uh, kind of techniques, you can show that it works for these type of controls. So that, so that why it works, like uh, to show this scaling. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the very nice talk. So I wonder if this um, unachievable Heisenberg limit is related to the lack of uh, decoherence-free subspace. Yeah. So uh, yes. Yeah, so if you have a decoherence-free subspace, of course you can achieve the Heisenberg limit. And uh, then, but then if you don't have decoherence-free subspace, like in principle, you can use like error correction. To do that, but then since with this protocol you cannot do error correction, then you you cannot achieve the Heisenberg. So so it might be related, but then, then it's not like a necessary and sufficient condition. So I I don't know, know the relation. Thanks. Yeah. All right, uh, very nice. Can I just ask uh, for the dephasing class where the H and K S holds? So between the sequential ancilla free and the sequential is just taking away the ancilla. That's the only thing you're doing. So you mean like the, the, the first and the second yeah. column? Yeah, so uh, I'm taking away the ancilla and then I also assume you can only do like unitary control. Oh, so the first column is measurements as well. Yeah, so uh, basically because you have like in the, in the first column, column, you have ancilla, so you can always defer the measurement to the end. So then it effectively means that you can do mid-circuit measurement. So yeah, but then in the restrictive control strategy, I don't allow sufficient amount of ancilla. That, that's why you cannot do measurements uh, many times as you want. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I had a question about, for extending your work, what class of uh, measurements would you perform in the systems? 
So uh, it's, a, it's actually like arbitrary POV and we can perform on the output state, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I have no restrictive uh, restriction on the, the measurements. And so you, once you get a measurement, you get like some measurement output, and then you would con like condition, um, uh, like, like the dy dynamics over time on like what measurement outputs would you get, or you think like more. You oh, more uh, the you end. mean like mid circuit measurement? Yeah. Uh, yeah. no, I I don't allow that because um, like here I only allow like a constant size ancilla. So that means I can only do mid mid circuit measurement like constant time, but but then the system is like. Infinitely long, so so then you you cannot do mid-circuit measurement every time step. So, I, okay. so I, I don't allow that. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I, this may be a very abstract question, but I thought that this um situation in ancillary free sequence chasteurity is um quite similar to like quantum error mitigation. And yeah, I want I just want to know that so is there any connection between your result and error mitigation? Yeah, so there might be some connection, but currently I, I don't see like it directly applies to error mitigation because like right now the protocol I consider has like the, the unknown parameter in the quantum channel instead of like in, in the initial input state. So if it's like in the initial state, then maybe uh, you can consider like uh, how the fission information change after the evolution. But then since it's in, like every time you, you put some new signal in the sequence, so there's some distinction, but then maybe some connection. I don't know. Do you have any closed form expressions for the control signals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So since I only consider like single qubit case, so it's actually quite simple analytically. So it's just like this type of unitary control. So it's just the rotation uh, that is uh, along the same direction as, as the signal. So basically it just tuned the, uh, the angle of the rotation to a specific direction. Uh, so, so this is for the defacing class channels, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, for uh, contractive channels? Yeah, for contractive channel, basically, uh, I show that it, it is at most a constant. So uh, yeah, so basically, like any type of sequence, it does not allow you to achieve the. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 